It all began in 1997. Great Britain officially hands over Hong Kong to the People's Republic of China. This marks the end of the British Empire in the Far East after a century and a half of domination. The story of this great city is about the years before this night and the years of success that will surely follow it. The bank has to choose, move with the crown or stay and be in the grip of China. HSBC, their principal worry was a concern that um, post-1997, the Chinese authorities might insist that the management of HSBC become more Chinese in character, that the top people be Chinese. And for that generation of British people running the HSBC, that was unacceptable, really. At that time, many people in Hong Kong felt that their Hong Kong was being abandoned. You know, we felt kind of betrayed. You kind of felt somebody was turning your back. Many people thought, whoa, this is the end of the bank. HSBC decides to have it both ways. It moves its headquarters to London, but keeps the heart of its business in Hong Kong. China has just opened its borders and promises to be a fabulous market. The priority is to flatter the new masters of Beijing. They described their brief as to create the best bank building in the world. The building was a statement of confidence. It was about stability, it was about permanence, it was a gesture of confidence in a future uh, beyond the transition of a colony into part of China. It was also making a statement about ambition. HSBC at that time was a local bank, and they have become one of the global players. The full extent of that we were only to realize later. A pioneer of globalization, HSBC intends to spread its Chinese DNA. In the early 2000s, it is the first foreign bank to establish itself in China. Its president, Stephen Green, serves as an ambassador of capitalism to the leaders of the Communist Party. The people in London, they know so well about China. They spend one third their time, or 20% of their time, if not more, in Hong Kong and travel to China constantly. While the Chinese economy is emerging as the engine of global growth, HSBC executives strategize their position. Initially, we were actually advisors to Bank of China, Shanghai to raise capital. So during the process, the president of Bank of Shanghai asked me, what about your own bank? We, lo we love HSB to be part of our investor groups. So I reported back to Stephen Green, and uh, actually Stephen was uh, quite good. Stephen took a flight, went to Shanghai together with me, had a dinner with the president of Bank of Shanghai. After dinner, he came out to say, I like this bank, and also I trust that individual. 
let's do the investment. And wow. of course, the payoff was good too. HSBC triples its investment and pockets nearly 300 million euros. The bank extends its honeymoon with Beijing by exploiting its own history. Under the dictatorship of Mao, it was the only bank to maintain a presence in China. When the giant woke up, HSBC was already firmly in place. It was a terrific message that HSBC were able to give, to say, we were always there, we never, we never left. And it's always tried hard to compare itself with the American banks. And it takes flying, these American banks, they come and they go. We, you know, we British, we stick around and, and stay. You know, it's the Chinese philosophy, isn't it? Think long. <laughs> Once again, history will accelerate the fate of HSBC. In September 2007, the financial crisis hits the streets of London. That I want to close this account as well. Totally cynical attitude for your customers. Panic seizes the clients of Northern Rock and threatens to spread to other banks. The British government proposes lending them money as an emergency response. HSBC snubs the meeting and refuses any public assistance. Being bailed out by the government, being given capital by the government, means that the government has influence on you. And HSBC wanted to be able to say, uh, you don't have this influence on us. We are independent. We're fine. We can recapitalize ourselves. And if you try to force us, uh, as one interlocutor told me, if you try to force us to take your money, we will take you to court and sue. You could ask, well, isn't this really arrogant? It is arrogant, but it is also the ability of the bank to signal to a government, we're a global bank, you're a single government, and so think about the relative power between us. HSBC bankers prefer to turn to their friends, Hong Kong businessmen who made their fortunes through trade with China. The bank offers to sell them 18 billion euros of shares. We knew when the bank was facing some problems, we have to help out. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the share price was very, very low at the time. Uh, and for most business people, the best thing was, why not take a share of the rights issue? And uh, those people that did, did very, very well. Did you make a lot of money on that deal? Did I make a lot of money on that deal? I think that, uh, um, yes, uh, uh, normally we don't uh, uh, give out figures, but uh, it, it's, it, it was a nice, it's a nice profit. Since that transaction, the price of each share has tripled. As always, HSBC made its shareholders rich. But history will remember that for the first time, Chinese money rescued a British bank. From now on, it is Beijing that holds the reins as the champion of globalization. <laughs>